It was the late spring of 2003, and I was 17 years old, sitting final exams in my high school in Calgary, a city in Western Canada. A few hundred of us would get together in the gymnasium to take these tests. It was back in the day before smartphones and Wi-Fi. So you might imagine that it was much harder to cheat on exams. But as they say, where there's a will, there's a way. We were only allowed to bring a few items into the exam room. Some pens or pencils, a bottle of water, some snacks, and for science and math exams, a calculator. We used to use these TI-83 plus scientific calculators, which were advanced for the time. And those in my class who were into gaming would download what were called calculator games and play them during class, irritating the teachers. One of my classmates figured out that he could actually download all of his class notes onto the calculator as well. And so for final exams, he tricked the teachers, brought his calculator with all of the notes loaded onto it into the exam room. And while the rest of us had been preparing and cramming and memorizing for the test, he was just pulling the answers off of his calculator. Was it fair? Definitely not. It was cheating. And I knew about it. Should I report what he'd done to a teacher, potentially getting my classmate into some serious trouble? Or not say anything? preserving our friendship and my reputation, which in high school was extremely important. What would you have done? The way we make decisions when confronted with a situation like this is by applying our values. Two of my strongest values are fairness and responsibility. Cheating wasn't fair to other students, but responsibility as a friend would lead me to keep his secret. In the end, I chose not to say anything. My classmate ended up graduating from high school and later university and went on to a successful business career while sidelining in petty crime, fraud, and later organized crime. This was one of the first instances I can recall of being faced with a moral dilemma, a situation in which we have to make a choice between two outcomes, both of which have pros and cons, where there appears to be no feasible alternative except one that violates our values or our ethical standards where not only is there no easy answer, but there's no right answer. There are just wrong answers. And we have to make up our minds which is more wrong than the other. As I got older, the moral dilemmas I faced became more pronounced because the consequences became more severe, particularly once I started working and volunteering with vulnerable people in the charity sector. About a year after I graduated from university, while living in Massachusetts, I started teaching a group of teenage boys in prison entrepreneurship. I was 23 years old. I learned that very few of these boys had champions in their lives, people who deeply cared about them. I did a brief survey during one of my prison classes to see how many of the boys would be interested in a mentor. At first, there was a little bit of confusion. Quite a few of the boys said that they would definitely be interested and their ideal activity would be taking that mentor out for dinner and a movie. <laughs> Slightly shocked and saddened that the boys didn't quite grasp the concept of a mentor, I spent some more time explaining it to them, and in the end, most wanted to take part. The idea of having a caring adult role model who was there to help them learn and grow was something that they craved. I decided to pilot the concept with a young teenager who was about to be released from prison, and I paired him up with a woman from Harvard Kennedy School. The two got along well, and with the encouragement of his mentor, he started developing his passion for science. When he was released from prison, the two of them even took a trip together to MIT University. I have a photo of them smiling in front of the university campus. Not long afterwards, I received an email from two senior staff within the State Department of Youth Services, advising me that the mentor's criminal background check had not been processed by the prison, something that was important due to the vulnerability of this young man, and which I thought had been done already. As a result, I was told that I needed to shut down the mentoring program immediately. It would not be possible to conduct the background check now, and it didn't matter that the young man had already left prison. Now this was a real bind. On the one hand, I didn't want to get into any trouble with the government, especially since I saw my future working in criminal justice reform and breaking the law while helping to, helping to move people away from prison and crime would be beyond hypocritical. But on the other hand, I just completed a course in mentoring at risk youth, where I learned that if a mentoring relationship lasts under six months with a vulnerable person, it actually has a damaging effect on the mentee. 
Because these young people have been abandoned so many times before in the past, it's just one more adult letting them down. So I had a choice. Either I could let the mentoring program continue and potentially put an end to my work in the Boston prison system, or I could stop it and possibly harm the mentee. What would you have done? In the end, I chose to stop the program. Four months later, the mentee, aged 18, armed with a gun, attempted to rob another young person, and in the process was shot and killed. It's impossible to know what harm, if any, was caused this young man by terminating the mentoring relationship too soon, and equally what the positive impact would have been of the continued support. At the same time, there's no way to have known what would have happened if I'd chosen to continue the program. Would I still be here speaking to you today? A few years later, I had another big dilemma. In 2012, at the age of 26, I founded Spark Inside, a London-based charity supporting young people leaving prison through professional life coaching. Coaching is all about enabling people to find solutions to their own problems without any external advice, guidance, or support. When a client asks a coach, what do you think I should do? The coach responds by saying, well, what do you think you should do? In other words, in coaching, the answers come from within, which is what makes it different to mentoring. One of Spark Inside's clients was a teenage boy who was about to be released from prison. Through coaching, he identified a goal of wanting to work in a restaurant upon release. Now, I knew how hard it would be for him to achieve that goal. Not only was he relatively unskilled, looking for a job in London where it's already competitive for young people to find one, but also he had a criminal record, which makes it much more difficult to find employment. At the same time, I knew that I had a colleague in London who ran a restaurant who was open to hiring people with criminal convictions. So here's the dilemma. In coaching, you don't offer help, support, or handhold somebody because it's all about enabling them to figure out how to do things for themselves. So calling up my colleague with the restaurant and asking him to do this young man a favor would definitely not be coaching, and therefore is not in alignment with my charity's mission or ethos. And if I intervened, I could possibly harm this young man's pride, his confidence, his willingness to give things a go in the face of potential rejection. And to be fair, if I did a favor for him, shouldn't I also do one for everybody else? However, helping this young man find a job could help change his life and direction. And what if he didn't find one and returned to crime or even back to prison? What would you have done? While we are busy pondering over this moral dilemma in the office, we later learned that the young man left prison and on his own without telling anybody, went up and down his local high street asking every single restaurant for a job, facing rejection after rejection after rejection until one restaurant said yes. Without my intervention, this young man took it upon himself to find a job and achieve his goal on his own. I've since faced several more dilemmas. Spark Inside, like all charities, requires funding. <coughs> Many of our funders want to meet the people they're supporting directly, in our case, in prison. But these prison visits make our clients feel like they're in a zoo, with funders coming in and out to take a look and have a conversation, and then leaving to go back home to their normal lives. These visits might create more harm, but if the funders don't visit, they may not donate, which also creates harm. Do we continue prison visits or stop them, or something in between? Similarly, many companies are interested in community social responsibility, whereby they offer to donate to charities that generally also offer their employees with volunteering opportunities, but usually just for one day, and preferably to support the most vulnerable clients, because then the staff feel like they're making more of a difference. Again, this single day of support might actually damage the clients, with one more adult coming into their lives and promising help, and then leaving abruptly. But without the funding support that companies like these provide to charities, we can't work with vulnerable people in the first place. Making a choice along a spectrum with poles of wrong and wrong is really tough. What would you do? 
I'd like to share one final moral dilemma with you. It's one that I experienced in preparing for this talk. I was originally invited to speak about the journey of transformation of young people leaving prison, drawing from examples from Spark Inside, my charity. And it's not the first time that I've been asked to do so. The problem isn't that I don't have any amazing stories of transformation to share with you. I have several. It's that I've become increasingly uncomfortable with the idea that I, as someone with no criminal record or history of incarceration, would be up here speaking on behalf of young people from London who've been to prison. Who am I to speak for them about their own journeys of transformation? They're the experts in their own lives, so why are they not invited here to TED and to similar platforms to share their own stories? <coughs> One reason is because there are plenty of people like me who are more than happy to tell their stories for them. Maybe societal perception is that we can do so more eloquently, with greater authority or relatability to certain audiences. And I get that. I also understand the argument that it's better to have anyone telling the stories of vulnerable people and marginalized groups than it is to have those stories not heard at all. And yet, I can't come to terms with the notion that if I and others like me continue happily acting as the voices of people who don't have the power, connections, or confidence to stand up here and tell their own stories, that we are actively contributing to the disempowerment of those groups. By trying to help marginalized people have a voice in the short term, in the long term, we are removing their ability to have one. Our positive intention, without considering the underlying moral dilemma, can breed an unintended negative outcome. And so I'm left with a choice. Do I share with you the journeys of transformation of young people leaving prison? Or do I wait until those young people are invited here to tell their own stories? Thinking critically through a moral dilemma is hard. It's much easier to pretend like the choice isn't there and to do nothing. But then we give up our power our agency, our ability to act. And owning the choice, I believe, is the moral way to get through a moral dilemma. And so, I made a choice. What would you have done? Thank you.